let's do this here. 275th painting episode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to look at the work of another one of my favorite artists. Today, we're going to be looking at Florine Stettheimer and this specific artwork, um, which is roughly about the same size as the painting we're going to make, about 9 by 12 size in actual original size. Um, I love this, this artwork. It's both a, a painting and a bit of a mixed media artwork, as well as the study for some costumes for a, an opera that she wanted to make that was never made. Um, and we'll talk all about it. I think it, I, I love the kind of the... There's um, a very playful, fun quality to her work. She's also a proto-feminist, a, a, you know, a really early... Well, not that early, but, you know, the turn of the last century, one of the kind of most uh, uh, audacious women of her time, I would say, in pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable by society. And I really admire her uh, fearlessness. So anyway, let's take a look at the, the plan for today's episode. We're going to start, we're going to get the image onto the canvas. I'll show you how to do that. We'll stain it. We'll talk about Florine's biography. We'll... Maybe a bit of an underpainting. Let's look at the background, foreground, background, and we're going to do some um, gluing of different things, textures. So today's going to be a kind of a different type of painting than we've done recently, but there's elements that are familiar to you if you've been with the channel for a while. Also, just consider liking this video right now, subscribing to the channel, and hitting the notification bell so you know when upcoming episodes are taking place. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation, as little as a dollar, you can use PayPal, YouTube Super Chat, but probably your best bang for the butt, buck <laughs> is to send an e-transfer. And you can contact me via my email, which is on the website and on the Facebook group. Speaking of which, I'll just show you that uh, there's a link to the Facebook group in the description below, and uh, I encourage you to take a photograph of the painting you're working on today, whether it's your recreation of Florian Stettheimer's piece or something else you've been working on that you want to share with the group. Once a month, I go through this and uh, find all of your artworks, organize them, and give some free feedback. So if you want to get better, that's one of the best ways to go about it, is getting a little bit of uh, feedback from a professional artist. That's me, by the way. <laughs> okay, so let's get this image onto the canvas. So, to, oops, come on. No, we want to go all the way down here. So here's the original image. And then I've done an outline using my iPad Pro and the Procreate app. And I just traced it out. And you can download this for free. There's a Dropbox folder. And... In that Dropbox folder, you'll see in the very top resources for our introductory ep paintings like to get started. And then these are our kind of our, our relatively more simple artworks. And here's today's painting down here. But you're also going to see another couple hundred for of <laughs> folders that are begun with numbers. And they're all, you know, I mean, Georgia O'Keeffe, who we'll talk about a little bit today, um, one of her peers. Um, so some more, maybe more complex, there's the Mona Lisa right there, etc. But anyway, let's go in here. You'll see that there's three files. We have the original painting and then two versions of the outline, a JPEG and a PDF. And you can just print them out on your printer at home. And so let's, uh, let's go to the, start this next step and get this painting rolling. So you can see, this is just a regular piece of paper. And I'm painting on a 9 by 12 sized canvas board. I've also, you know, they come wrapped in plastic. And then I took the plastic off and I put a second coat of acrylic gesso, white acrylic gesso. And then sanded it down. So now it's smoother than it normally is when you pull, take it right out of the, of the plastic. And then we'll tape this down. Okay. 
Okay, and then now I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper, although technically this is actually graphite transfer paper, just in, I put it in that same envelope. And let's, uh, they do exactly the same thing. Different materials, same thing. Um, so, my big question to myself is, how am I going, what do I want to do here? How much, um, how much mixed media, if any, do I want to put on here? I could do this entire artwork as with paint. Um, and although that's not what she did, she's glued different things onto the surface of this artwork. So... And I don't have the exact materials that she used. So how do I want to do that? Well, let's trace it out. I'm, I'm also not going to trace out all of the, the flowers, because I'm going to either glue them there or use a stencil to put them there. And I haven't figured out exactly which one I want to do yet. Kind of... Uh, like to figure that out as I go and I'll probably do a little bit of both quite frankly so that we have options um. So it's a good idea just to double check, see how that's turning out. I'm just going to do little circles for those flowers. In fact, I'm just going to do little circles here for all these flowers. Okay, good enough to get that started. Okay, actually let's just be keeping that handy. Ah, there's Deborah, Paula, and Lolly. Great, we got the band back together. That's great. Okay. Let's see. Let's go to our next step now. So once we've got the image on the canvas, let's stain it with a little bit of color. We'll let that dry, and then we'll um, start painting it, right? So the first thing that I like to do is do this technique called the imprimatura. It's, it translates to the, the priming layer or the first layer of paint. Um, the Italians have been doing this all the way since, uh, you know, early Renaissance and, and, and before. The paint I'm about to use here is, the, this is the paint. I'm not sponsored, given any free supplies or anything. I bought them just like everybody else. But this is, I really like this brand. I think it's the, uh, the best bang for the buck. It's, it's considered to be a student-grade paint, so not the best paint that you can buy. But, you know, we've done 275 of the most famous paintings in human history with this paint. And um, I, I haven't heard any complaints, all right? So I'm about to use this Azo Yellow Deep. And if you don't have this color or you don't have this set of paints, well, here's, let's run through a few different brands. Golden, 
right? The same tube of paint is about $40 to about $12, and it's about a third the size, right? So it is a better quality paint, more pigment, but you probably won't notice a difference. There's Liquitex, Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color, but not Museum Color because they put a, a high amount of uh, ultra or er, titanium white into the paint in, to make it a bit more opaque. But it it means that whenever you mix the paint together, everything is a little bit pastel, and it and it makes it impossible to get the black. As you know, I like to mix my own black. And just as a quick little refresher, if you want to mix your own black, here's your recipe. Uh, we'll talk about that because we're going to mix some black here. But ultimately what we're doing here is using what we call split primary palette. Two yellows, two reds, and two blues. One being cool, one being warm. If, you, if you've never heard of that concept before, go back and watch some of the very first episodes as part of this Master Study series. I explain, I have a whole episode explaining it in depth. And once you watch that, it might still be a little bit strange, but it makes sense when you use it, right? It's it's easier to just jump in than it is to explain how to swim, right? So let's um, let's stain this canvas. I'm going to use a little bit of water here. This is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic paints. You don't have to. It's not a rule, but it's. Um, gently encouraged because you know just think you use water to clean your brush so if you're constantly adding water to acrylic paint you're you're diluting the paint you're breaking down the bonds so why am i doing this well i'm staining this canvas i'm, I'm less painting and more staining this is gesso which, which is what this white surface is is a plaster and plaster as you may know absorbs water very very well and so i'm kind of using the paint against its um its uh, best properties because it works very well in this particular instance with water in it it'll also dry you know a little faster as well that water evaporates. Okay. One of the reasons why I like to kind of go in both directions is that it helps ensure that the paint really gets into the weave of the canvas. Sometimes if you're just sort of going in one direction, there might be little pockets where the canvas isn't touched by paint. That's another reason why I also use water, is water is more likely to kind of you know bleed out into the, the weave of the canvas or the plaster and really fully saturate it and less likely to have uh, the white of the canvas kind of appearing through at different times. Now you don't have to use yellow, that's definitely one of my own kind of signature things. Traditionally artists use a warm brown, like a rusty red color, uh, probably most likely to mimic the look of, of a wood panel, which is what artists used for uh, know, a thousand years before they moved to canvas. Um, okay, so let's go to our next step here. Sorry, I took a allergy medication. Just waiting for that to kick in. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's now talk about Florine Stettheimer and who she was and why I think she's so important and why she's one of my favorite artists. So um, let's start here. We'll look at her 
Wikipedia. Uh, so she was born in 1871 and dies in 1944 at age 72. And, um, you know, at a relatively young age, I think it was a little bit unexpected when she passed away, but she did create a lot of work during her time and, and was a, a really interesting, you know, kind of eccentric personality and really a, a major important figure in the New York art scene and really specifically like the New York avant-garde art scene of the you know 1920s or so um so let's see where should we start let's just go right back to her her youth so she's born in Rochester New York and she's I think she has six or five brothers or one brother and four sisters of which she is the second youngest of the children. And her mother was from a very wealthy German Jewish family. And um, so the family never was never really want for anything. They, they were raised and, and lived in a relatively wealthy uh, family in, in a wealthy part of New York City. Uh, but, you know, just because you got money doesn't mean you're, you're immune from difficulty. Her father deserted the family when she, when she was very young and moved to Australia. And as far as I know, that was the last time they ever saw him. So the she was raised in a family, you know, by her mother in a, and with three older sisters. So she was raised in a family dominated by women and, you know, a, a strong, her mother was a very strong woman. And I think that really kind of uh, showed her that she didn't need a man, she didn't need to be married in order to live a happy, successful life, that being uh, a single woman was more than fine to, 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 for her own health, right? Which is, you know, even today, there's still lots of attitudes that you need to you know, a woman must find a man and settle down and have kids in order to be, uh, to fulfill their destiny, right? Um, but certainly, a hundred years ago, that was, that was just an accepted law of nature, right? And so, I, I think seeing her mother raise the family on her own, now, they, they were wealthy, and I'm sure they had help around the house, you know, uh, butlers and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, seeing her mother kind of handle most of those duties all by herself, or at least delegating responsibility, I think made made quite the impression on her. And as we go forward and we learn a little bit more about her, I think you'll see that her, that, you know, she, she really carried forth the, that kind of feminist spirit before I think the the term had even been been coined. Um, so she um, she also the, the the two her oldest sister and her brother married at a relatively young age and moved out of the house. So basically, it was her mother and her the second oldest sister and that her youngest sister again. Florine was the second youngest child of six kids so <laughs> um so the but the 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 three children and the mother kind of formed this um this little group and they and they often spent a lot a lot of time together hanging out and going to museums and doing things together a lot and her mother and her sisters uh play prominent roles in uh, the later kind of social gatherings that they would have. Um, so I think, again, there's that idea of her mother kind of, um, uh, or the, the, the children sort of seeing their mother as, uh, you know, both a parental figure, but also as a friend and a peer uh, that... And I, you know, I think it means a lot for a child to have, um, to to have to, to to spend time with someone of a different generation, who treats them 
uh, with respect and dignity and doesn't kind of talk down to them and um, and belittle them. So I think, again, that also showed her that, you know, that's instilled in her a great deal of confidence as a young woman. Um, you know, being from an affluent family, there were lots of opportunities to study art. Uh, she had some private tutors. Um, she also took lessons uh, at the Art Students League in New York City, which is, you know, a very important uh, art school, uh, which still exists to this day. Um, but back in the day, kind of before you had really formal art schools, you would have things like this, where there were kind of like art clubs, where young artists and older artists could gather, and there were like there was usually like a bar, or a restaurant in there, you know, where mostly at the time, mostly men would gather and smoke cigars, and then they would might have presentations once a week by members of the group, you know, like slideshows or. Some of their work would be up and there would be kind of a, an opportunity to look at, at each other's work and critique it, offer feedback, as well as figure drawing classes and um, sometimes, you know, someone who might be an expert in a particular type of approach would give a demonstration and everyone would gather around and watch. So uh, this was like a, a major hub in New York City, you know, 100, 150 years ago. Um, you know, you have, I mean, the, the, I'm sure if we looked on here, we would see the, the, the names of, of important American artists who went through here. I remember I was visiting some friends who uh, were uh, closely allied with, or they were, I think they were on the board of the Art Students League, and I went there to meet them, and uh, we had some spaghetti, and then after the spaghetti, they're like, oh, would you mind kind of washing these dishes? And I was like, oh, okay, that's okay. And... So I washed the dishes, and afterwards, as I said, that's where Jackson Pollock used to wash the dishes so that um, in lieu of, of payment for some classes, and we thought you might get a kick out of having washed dishes in the same sink as Jackson Pollock used to. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, that was a little weird to make me wash the dishes after dinner. I mean, I'm happy to do it, but I, this, that was very, you know, I kind of was like, oh, that's, that is kind of cool that I just washed dishes where Jackson Pollock used to wash dishes. Anyway, <laughs> um, let's see. Um, uh, so I think it's maybe even, uh, well, let me just kind of go through a, a because she's from a wealthier family, she's has an opportunity to probably go to some uh, art ex exhibitions, art openings, uh, and what we've called salons back in the day, which don't really exist, you know, that much. Back in the day, you would have these gatherings. You know, we just talked about the Art Students League as being one, but often you'd have like a wealthy collector, right? might have people over for cucumber sandwiches and champagne and you you would deliberately invite like a couple of musicians a couple of poets and writers and dancers and painters and you know some also other wealthy collectors you know bankers and politicians and you'd have maybe 20 30 people over for dinner and everyone would get get to know one another and so it's through those uh, salons, through her family's connection, where she meets some, you know, the many of the most important artists of the time, and um, she she's probably is seeing some art, you know, being in, living in New York, she's seeing art that most people in New York or in North America hadn't seen before, both because she's traveling, also, but also because some collectors are buying that work and showing them with her family, so she's probably one of the most um, familiar artists to what's going on across the ocean because around the turn of the last century Paris is the center of the art world and New York has yet to to rise to the prominence where it is today you know most people would probably consider New York to be uh, for the last 50 years or more to, to be kind of the center of the art world but that wasn't the case back at the time and 
Um, so that would have also given her a certain amount of cachet where, you know, other young artists might be like, oh, I heard you, were, you, you saw this or that. Like, what was that painting like? You see this Matisse, like, tell us all about it. What did, how was it painted? Um, she also goes and sees operas and ballets and, and musical performances all the time, and she's deeply affected when she sees Degailev's Ballet Russe in 1912. Right, so Sergei Degailev was one of the great showman, um, uh, ballet, musical impersonarios who was traveling all over the world with this famous Russian ballet troupe, and of course. Um, so she would have, you know, and, and if you were, if you were of anyone of, of, in the cultural elite, you would have been familiar with them and you would have seen them wherever they were. You would probably would have gone to see them. So she, in this case, she sees them in 1912 and it makes a huge impact on her. And she immediately, you know, says to herself, well, that was, that's an amazing performance. That those costumes, the music is just incredible. I want to write my own opera. So she begins working on this, this, um, uh, her own you know, epic opera, the, the Orphée de, de Katzal, uh, which I don't even know what that would roughly translate to. Um, oh, the, well, I don't know. The cats. Let's, let's just, I'm, let's do a C, little Google translate here. I have some idea, but I hate kind of just spreading <laughs> rumors around here. Orpheus of the Cat's Art. Yeah, see, I was like, what is... It's not quartz or four, it's... Um, Orpheus being a, a, um, uh, a Greek um, <laughs> mythological character, right? Uh, so, but... You know, the, the idea is that it's also based on these kind of big balls that places like the Art Students League would have once a year, where you would have all these bohemian artists and painters and dancers would kind of hold these, you know, it would, be, it would what would it be like? You know, it's it's kind of like a masquerade ball slash rave <laughs> You know, where I'm sure people are doing some illicit drugs and there's probably some hanky-panky going on in the dark recesses of the of the ballroom, you know, that kind of thing. Pretty edgy crowd, right? So she kind of, she, she writes her ballet, or this ballet slash opera um, inspired, it's, and, and it's been sort of talked about as sort of like a, uh, ballet within a ballet so it's like a it's like a ballet I, as far as i understand like the story is sort of like the 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 about the staging of a ballet if that makes any sense so the the performers are sort of performing as actors who are preparing for a ballet <laughs> or or you know one of these um, masquerade kind of balls, right? And so she goes for for years working on the costumes, the songs, the music, designing sets and props and all this kind of stuff. Uh, what's what's kind of unfortunate is even to this day they've never actually staged the performance of this opera. Which is kind of unusual. It doesn't. Well, I think as we see here, we'll see. It's not super surprising, but it's not. It's kind of odd that it wasn't mounted during her lifetime, um, or that someone today hasn't decided to kind of go back and 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 you know resurrect it. As there's so many other things that have seen the light of day after having disappeared uh, for for years. Um. Oh, I should I should mention that today's artwork was was a study of the costumes for one of the characters of the performance. So um, clearly, like I'm also interested in that performance or or the performance that never was, um, as well as I'm I'm also very fascinated by costume design and all that kind of stuff as well. 
Um, so let's see what else. Uh, oh, you know, again, she's she becomes another major event in New York art history or art history in general is the outbreak of World War One, and because of that, you have you have a lot of artists that enlisted on both sides of the war, but there are also a lot of artists that left Europe at that time. Like World War One was a pretty nasty war, and certain people saw the that whole situation unfolding and wanted to get out of town, had no interest in participating whatsoever. So you have this influx of, uh, of artists and filmmakers uh, arriving in New York at that time. Of course, that happens. There's a second wave of mostly German and Russian um, uh, artists arrive after before World War II as well. A lot of Jewish people obviously trying to escape the Nazi plague. Um, but, you know, this next kind of phase of artists to arrive, or the first phase, first wave, you know, are, include artists like Marcel Duchamp and Francis Picabia, um, who are two really important French artists. We're going to do an entire week devoted to Marcel Duchamp in September, I believe, um, because he's, I think, he's certainly one of the most important artists of all time. And, and uh, there was a period of time where I was really, really into Marcel Duchamp. So uh, I want to take a look at his work. And Picabia is also, I'm a huge fan of Picabia. Uh, but they this kind of circle of artists forms around the, the great photographer Alfred Stieglitz. And Alfred Stieglitz is generally regarded as probably the most important photographer in history. And he also had his own art gallery. And he exhibited many artists like Picasso and Matisse for the first time in North America at his gallery. So he was you know, a super important figure. And so there's this group of artists that are kind of gravitating around him, including Florine Stettmeyer. And through them, uh, she meets like Duchamp and Duchamp becomes a very close friend of Florine Stettmeyer. And uh, later on, Duchamp is the, is the, he himself mounts a retrospective of Florine Stettmeyer's work after she dies. Uh, which I think is saying something. I don't, as far as I know, Duchamp didn't do that for anybody else. And, you know, for Duchamp to recognize her as an artist that he admired so much that he was going to personally manage and organize, curate the retrospective of her art after she passed away is, you know, should perk the ears up of people. I mean, I'm sure it certainly it did at the time, but today, considering how popular and well-known Duchamp is, I think that his, he's really lending his, his reputation, a stamp of approval on this great artist, or towards this great artist. Um, I should also mention here that one of the, the things that, I, I don't know exactly what her uh, sexual orientation was. As far as I know, she never married. Um, but she was certainly in, as part of her own salons, because she then would, she, being a wealthy person, she couldn't have lots of people over to her, her apartment. Her mother and her two sisters, or the two sisters that I again mentioned that were kind of part of this little group that had been formed, um, uh, family ensemble, if you would say, uh, would organize these salons, and you would have a lot of people. Um, you'd have a lot of gay musicians, painters, artists, poets, um, lesbians, um, bisexuals, even I'm sure some trans people back in the day, all of which was super, uh, not only frowned upon, but illegal, right? So she's putting her herself out there a little. I mean, obviously they they're they're not advertising them on the cover of the New York Times, but you know, being a wealthy socialite, you know, it's um you're you're potentially asking for trouble if word gets out that you're hosting these salons um in which there is a high percentage of people who who are not fitting into the binary heterosexual um uh, um, 
you know, the, 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 the binary as it existed in, uh, at the, t or as was sort of privileged and, and maybe continues to be privileged. Uh, so that also really endeared her to the art community, many of whom happened to, to not fall within the traditional, um, uh, uh, categories. So she was really respected by 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 pretty much everyone she came in contact with. Really, kind of put her mouth, her money where her mouth is, right? Um, let's see. Um, I think this just her talks a little bit about the relationship between her and Duchamp and how they uh, inspired one another. There's there's a famous. Uh, so maybe it's just worth just taking a quick little look at Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp is uh, famous for probably most well known. We're going to do one of these paintings, a new descending the staircase. Um, he's probably very. If you've heard of Duchamp at all, you may have heard of this artwork where he took a urinal and turned it on its side and signed it. Some people say it was actually he actually made it of ceramic. Some people actually say it was made by a woman, um, or at least this idea of, of taking an, an object and and just displaying it as an artwork, which Duchamp called a ready-made, was not, not actually Duchamp's invention or idea. It was something created by another woman, which is we're going to look at that woman as well when we do uh, our focus on Duchamp. Uh, but I just want to, okay, so this whole concept of Rose C'est la Vie was sort of Duchamp's drag in, um, personality, I, I guess you would say. He dressed up as this woman and, and had photographs of him taken as this woman. He was really into uh, puns and, um, uh, and puzzles. And so what he was really up to is, we're not really sure, but it's it's generally considered that he modeled th that personality, this alter ego, after Florine Stettheimer. Um, let's see. Here's towards the end of... Well, I guess she starts making these in the 20s, late 20s. But she kind of started this whole series that uh, she called the Four Cathedrals, which were each one dedicated to a different aspect of New York City, the, the kind of the, the, you know, in this case here, so we have the, the Cathedral of Broadway and, and the theater and, and performances, the, the big showy space. The Cathedral of Fifth Avenue, which is, you know, the traditionally like the business area of New York where the, the super wealthy are and the politicians. The Cathedrals of Wall Street where... You know, the, again, business, the money-making center of New York was. Um, and then you have the Cathedrals of Art, the Museum of uh, the Metro. I think there was going to be three paintings as part, or maybe not. There was the, there's the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan, and the Whitney Museum, where the, which at the time were the three big art museums in New York City. The, the Guggenheim, I think... Guggenheim would have been built. I'm not sure why she excluded the Guggenheim from from her her three great uh, art museums in New York. Because um, um, maybe there was some sort of friendly competition there because the Guggenheims were also very wealthy uh, art collectors. But these were sort of her, her, her kind of magnum opus that she was working on at the time of her death. So it, it remained unfinished. I won't share that on the screen for more than a couple seconds, but the image we just saw um, is considered to be the, the first nude self-portrait by a female artist in art history. Um, so, you know, back in the day, and really all the way up until very recently, um, if you were a woman and you wanted to be seen at in an art museum, you had to take your clothes off and pose for a painting by a male artist. That was the only way for women to get into the museum. Um, some literally not letting women into the museum to look at the art, never, never mind <laughs> making their own art and hanging it on the wall, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, but 
she, again, being a, a proto-feminist and someone who is like, how come it's just the, why are, is it just guys making paintings of nude women? We don't see that many nude men being painted. Maybe women should make paintings of nude men. And what if I make a p nude painting of myself? All of, so those things are, are pretty revolutionary concepts. Even to this day, it's it's uncommon for even for a male or female artist to do a nude self-portrait of themselves. So again, you go back a hundred years and you're seeing this this woman who's who's really like an iconoclast, defying every sort of norm you can possibly imagine. Uh, you know, if someone did that today, it would be maybe a little like, whoa, that's pretty brave. That's kind of, I haven't seen that before. And then you go, oh, here's Florine Stettheimer did that a hundred years ago. I mean, and it still kind of has a little bit of, um, uh, uh, what would you call it? Power to, to you know, the idea of, of you know when an artist paints their own self portrait you know there you have this sense of of uh, the artist you know looking at the viewer right the the tables are kind of turned a little bit and to put herself in in a vulnerable position where she's also now naked and looking at you is kind of like whoa like this is She's not some vulnerable woman who's taking her clothes off, uh, being paid by some, you know, potentially skeezy artist, male artist, and, um, you know, at his potential mercy, locked in his studio. Here she is. She's controlling the entire situation and flipping the tables. And there's, you know, like, hope I don't know how you would... It just seems like a very um, uh, that just it just takes a lot of courage, and I, I I just think it just tells you everything you need to know about who this woman is, the level of confidence, the audacity uh, to do something like that, even to this day is still I think admirable, depending on who you you would talk to. But I don't think there's very many people that I've ever met who have that level of courage to... I mean, it's almost like it's... The, you know, the idea of of doing that is... Um, there's there's also a level of... What would you, you call it? Um, um, you know, there, it's a performance, but I could also see some people... Like really rolling their eyes and like, oh my goodness! Like, uh, anyway, I just think that that's that that takes a fairly strong character to pull something like that off. Uh, let's just look at a couple more of these artworks. There's there's her obviously. Um, what else do I want to show? There's the artwork itself. So this painting um, is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, you can see here is on display. Here's all of the other costumes and designs for that opera that she had organized. Um, this this is the video of the, the, the class I did on using stencils to, to do Jasper John's flag. And I think I just want to share this really quickly. This is nice. So we you can see the size of some of these. For the cup. These little, these sketches where, oops. The blue boards. So I'm not gonna play more than that because I'll this video get demonetized and taken down. But um, it does give you a sense of like, the, the original artwork that we're about to do is really roughly about this same size and also has a lot of texture. There's there's fabric and things glued to it. Um, what else do I want to say before I move on here? Oh, what I think is 
so okay, a couple of things. She was also a writer. She did a lot of writing. She wrote in her diaries and she wrote lots of poetry. Much of which is much of which has been collected and published. It was published by her sister. Um, one of the interesting things that she, um, as part of her will, she wanted all of her artwork to be donated, specifically donated, not purchased, but donated to museums across the United States. And she, when she had exhibitions, the very few exhibitions of her work that she had, because I don't think she was particularly interested in, in exhibiting her work. I think she was more interested in the social aspects of art um, and having her friends over at her apartment and, and people looking at it. For her, that was enough. But um, I think one of the interesting things is that she would price her work outrageously high. So some of these paintings that, you know, if you if you watch some of the videos that are in the description below, you'll see, you know, some of them, you know, some, they're various different sizes, but she would, let's say for a painting like this, she would say at the time, oh, it's uh, to buy this is $150,000. People are like, what? $150,000 for that painting, like, that's more, that's like the most expensive painting on earth. So she's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And she did that deliberately because she didn't really want to sell her art. And it's funny because sometimes you see this at coffee shops where someone's got a, you know, a drawing of a dog and they want $10,000 for it. And you're like, $10,000 for a painting that's on display in a coffee shop. Like, that's more than, you know, most of the famous artists that you've seen at a famous art gallery are charging for their paintings. So, um, but she, she was just like, yeah, I'm not interested in selling my work. That's the price. If you want to pay that, then maybe I'll even raise the price. If you can afford that, well, then maybe you can afford double. So, uh, and because obviously she wasn't in need of money. So, so her selling her work wasn't, it wasn't a particular, um, priority for her. Uh, so, um, she is, you know, like Van Gogh, an artist that sold very few, if any, artworks during her lifetime. But in her case, it was done deliberately, which I, I had never really heard of another artist who has done that um, in the past. Uh, but again, that's why she also wanted her work donated to museums. She didn't want uh, museums dipping into their acquisition budget to buy her work. She wanted it instead to be donated so that they could then use whatever money they have to buy other art, uh, by other artists, which is commendable, you know. Um, I wish there were some very wealthy artists today who would do similar things like that so that they could acquire art by maybe younger emerging artists. I think um, just as we get close to wrap up here, you know, she... Um, her work, you know, is very, you know, some people would have called it like this faux naif style, like um, fake outsider art, in that sometimes the figures are uh, maybe potentially, might one might say, a little clumsy, or they ignore traditional figurative um, proportions, etc. And, you know, maybe look like the art of uh, an artist that hasn't had an academic training. And although she did learn how to how to paint from great artists throughout her her um, studies, she kind of took a, 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 a very loose approach to the way that she was painting and wasn't didn't clearly was not concerned about what other people thought of it or whether it would sell or be written about or celebrated. She was just really happy just to make art for her own self and to, to please her friends. There's this, um, there's a great video here where it talks about a portrait she did of Alfred Stieglitz. Remember Stieglitz being that uh, famous photographer and gallery owner, and art promoter. Um, so, and she gave the painting to him, right? And uh, so she would do that with many of her friends and make portraits of them and give them to her friends. And you can watch this whole video. It's in the description below, kind of talking about the creation of that painting and all the little details that are in it. Um, but what's kind of sad is that, you know, really just as after she died, 
the art world kind of pivoted away from, you know, the avant-garde, like surrealist figurative painting of the 1930s and 40s to abstract expressionism in the 50s and 60s. And so her work basically sort of disappeared. Even though it was in these major collections around the world, it, it, it basically was not on display for a generation. And only very recently has it come back um, onto the walls of major museums like the Metropolitan and the Museum of Modern Art and Guggenheim, Whitney, etc. Um, there was just a major exhibition retrospective of hers at the Jewish Museum in um, uh, New York City, which is where another, which is where this video, which, I'm, which I just played a little clip of where we saw today's painting on display was from. So anyway, the, uh, I think she's just a super fascinating, very um, um, like a groundbreaker of an artist and iconoclast um, and probably was also a lot of fun I, I imagine right if you're if you're someone who likes hosting parties at your house all the time and you have the you have the space and the money to host all these people you probably are a very social person and you like <laughs> you like having fun right so um and Considering the, the 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 circle of friends she had, um, who were some, many of whom were kind of notorious party animals, I'm sure there was um, some some lots of tales to 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 recount of some of those salons. Uh, if anybody remembers anything that happened, anyway, let's move on here to our next step underpainting do we want to do underpainting well let's take a look at the original and just think about how we're going to tackle this because her style is how on earth did she make this painting like i'm looking at the background the sustain that she's got going on there Hmm. Do we want to do an let's let's do an underpainting because I have a feeling the way that I'm going to approach this painting it could get a little bit wild. So I want to see if I can, um, uh, you know, I'm a, I I could be a little bit afraid of of losing some details here. So. Let's put some paint on the palette. I need the cool red so maybe I'll just hold off on that for a moment let's mix some black right so earlier I just showed that you know we take some of our cool yellow cool blue and warm red mix these guys together I'm not too worried about getting a perfect mix here, a perfect black, at least at this stage, as long as I can get something that is just dark. Um, and there's going to be a lot of blue, so sometimes I've, I've done this with just using a, a really dark blue, but since I'm about to paint blue over top of it, it could just get completely hidden. So... Hmm. 
That's who I should get sponsored by. If I ever get sponsored, it'd be like a tea company. Anybody who's got a connect at a tea company. I want somebody that drinks lots of tea. <laughs> Let me know. <clears throat> I bought this brush uh, a couple weeks ago. I used it for a, for a previous painting, um, but I just got it for like five bucks at Michael's Art Supply while I was there. And it's held up pretty good. I, I think it's kind of a nice little brush. So. So this is just gonna kind of help ensure that as I go, if I load it up with paint, that to be able to find my lines. Oh, there's Heidi and Sandra in the chat too. Great to see you guys. So let's see. Uh, let's look at this original again. And so I get ready for the next step. How on earth did she make that? It almost looks like. I was going to say, I thought maybe she poured paint and stained it like that. Hmm. Well, I think, you know what, at this stage, let's, let's go to our next step here. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to make the flowers that are going to go in the background here. I'm going to do that right now. These little flowers. I was going to go out and buy some little things, um, but not everybody has those. So what I think I'm going to do, I mean, I've got all sorts of little... I mean, I could glue things like that on here. But I also, 
there's a, there are two ways that I think I might do this. One of which is I've got these like little stickery things that, you know, I'm having a, a three-year-old daughter here and she's been eating all of our, she eats her stickers and she's been puking them up is one of the reasons why she's been ill lately. So, um, I've been kind of hoarding her stickers the last little bit. So I'm thinking of potentially taking stickers and cutting these out. And then I might also do some where I make a stencil. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get some of these out here. Like how many, how many hearts do we need? Or flowers, I mean. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty, one, twenty, two, twenty, three, twenty, four, twenty, five, twenty, six, twenty, seven, twenty, eight, twenty, nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four, thirty five, thirty six, thirty seven, thirty eight, thirty nine, forty, forty one, forty two, forty three, forty four. And I might have miscounted there a little bit. So I don't know if I want to do all forty four. That could take me a while. Um, let me get some of these out though. And get my scissors. Wonder, can I make? See how well this works. That will get the texture for sure. Hmm. Do I really want to cut a whole bunch of these out or should I try doing a stencil? Think about doing a stencil instead. Uh, where did I, I thought I had some cardboard? I got okay. Here it is. is significantly larger. Hmm. Last time I did this, it was Hmm. What if I just try painting it? That might be, that might be better. 
before I open those up. Let me see if I got some. Okay, let's. I do. I know I have jars of all this. Okay, let's use this. Looks like I have dipped into this. Okay, so this will be a bit of an experiment. Let me scoop some of this out. I'll show you what this material is here in a moment. So this here is my heavy matte gel. And I'm going to try to maybe sculpt some uh, flowers with this and then blow dry it and try to paint over top of it. We'll see what the results are. I was going to try using a stencil, um, but we'll see if paint, if I can get away with it as paint. too bad. Okay, this is going to take me a little bit to get this done, but what if I take little blobs like that? A syringe. I wonder if this would go through a syringe. It might be too thick. You know what? Let me. I've got, I got lots of syringes because our daughter. That's how we give her medication. So maybe I'm going to sacrifice a syringe. Let me run and get a syringe. Okay, so, don't know if I'll need a drill. This would be awesome if I could squeeze paint out of there.
This wouldn't be such an issue if I was just using regular paint. But matte medium. Or not matte medium, gel medium. Ha ha ha! Look at that. Okay, cool. So, this will work. It's just going to be a bit of a pain. So, let me just scrape this off. I'm going to space them out a little bit more. Now, of course, this is going to take a while for it to dry. I might have to blast it with the hair dryer. It's definitely not going to be dry tonight. It's certainly not dry during this episode, but it's okay. We can, I can still work on part of it. This is one of these things where by the time I'm done, I'll have figured out the technique. Oops. <laughs> I already love this. I already love how that looks. I want to try to avoid putting too much medium on the palette until I actually need it because it'll it starts to dry at least on the outside and if you know it starts you know that it might form like a bit of a a skin it's obviously easier to to do this before it um, gets too thick Uh, 
not this is why I love doing these episodes. It's like when would I ever give myself permission to do something like this in my regular daily life? Probably never. And now that I know that this works, I mean, I, this would certainly, this would work very easily with regular acrylic paint. If I ever wanted to use this for whatever reason, but now that I know it works with matte or gel medium. You know, it's just the getting of the medium into the syringe, which is the, the most difficult thing. And I think I'm getting a hang of how to get that stuff in here. Okay, so I think the technique is you kind of take it and then just sort of push it in a little bit. Look how gross my fingers are getting. So I somehow got my sleeve into it. So I don't have that many more to do. Obviously it's not all what 45 that I counted on hers. I'd also think like if I was doing more of these, I'd probably want to get a bigger, better syringe. Um, because one thing, I, I can already feel like the syringe is kind of getting a little sticky. I'd probably have to, if I was doing a lot more of these, probably have to wash it out. A 
I'm glad I only have like a couple more to do because this is just getting pretty gross. See if I can just use all this residue in my fingers for this last one. Okay. Do you want to do any more? One more little one in between there. Even though she didn't have one there, but that's just... There we go. I'm going to wash my hands in this sink here. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh... That is cool. I love how that looks. I guess there's some on her hair as well, but maybe I could do that later on. Um, I'm just going to put this excess gel back. Next thing, I'm going to blow dry this probably for a couple of minutes. So I know it's not the most exciting, entertaining thing on earth, but without that, I won't be able to really proceed. So I'm going to mute the mic.
Okay, so I hit the this painting with the come on with the blow dryer. Now this is still they're they're not wet to the touch, but uh, they are uh, like there's no no paint coming off of my finger, but I can feel like if I just put any weight on there, it would just splatter out, which is okay. I think I could still, we'll see how much I can get done on top of this. Um, but, uh, okay, so let's, let's go to our next step here with the background. In fact, maybe I'll start a different tab here. Okay, so now I've got the texture of those flowers established. Now I want to put some color over top of it. Now they're not, ideally I would let this dry overnight um, in a kind of a warm, you know, room temperature space. My studios can get pretty cold and that's not the best place to let acrylic dry because it will it'll take a long time to dry and mold can form um, when it's, when the drying process is really slow. So, you know, somewhere just like in a living room on a shelf somewhere where it's a little bit out of the way uh, is, is more than fine. Also not a very humid place, maybe not in your bathroom right before you take a hot shower or something, right? Uh, because again, that will lend moisture back into the paint. So, let's see. I have a feeling, so what I want to do now is this gray color in the background. It's almost like a, some kind of a wash. Um, okay, well, let's see if we can mix that color. I mean, we've got our black already. So... And I'm probably going to put... Let's... I'm, I'm probably going to put some medium in it to thin it out. Uh, so maybe let's just see what that medium would look like. So this is my matte medium. going to make this paint transparent. Let's just see. It's almost still a little bit too dark. So let's put even more matte medium in here, which actually benefits me because I'm going to make it last go a little bit uh, longer. I can get away with this little batch going across the entire canvas. Super delicate with how I apply that over my little flowers here.
So I'm being as gentle as possible on top of these flowers that I made. Oops, that one. Kind of, I can, you know, I, as I'm touching them, I can feel them kind of, you know, they're like a, you know, a boil or something, you know, like they're big zit. Just wants to pop. I'm gonna be delicate. I mean, it wouldn't be a disaster if I had to um, squeeze out more paint, but you know, it'd just be a bit of a pain. It'd be nice just to move on from that step and not have to to do it again, right? You know, I just occurred to me another option. I probably could have used a hot glue gun and done this with hot glue, and that would have gone fast. The one thing with hot glue is not really particularly archival art material. Uh, these, this, the matte medium is going to dry clear, ultimately. Just something to keep in mind if you're, if I was planning on leaving this on the top surface, it looks white right now, but will, when it's dry, look more, you know, when it's thick, it's, it, it won't dry clear as a, as a, as like a glass window, but it will dry um, it'll look kind of like a foggy kind of quality, I don't know how to semi-transparent, semi-opaque Now it's kind of a bummer that this has actually gone really brown, and that's because you know I I added um, a medium into the black to make it more transparent, and um, the yellow input amateur is coming through and mixing optically and making it look more brown. It is I don't mind. I think you know maybe even another coat of this would be okay. Maybe even adding a little bit of white into it, perhaps. But let's, uh, let's just take a moment to blow dry this.
Okay, so I think I'm going to mix another version of this. I'm going to use a lot of cool blue. We'll mix a bit more of my black, but it's going to be really predominantly cool blue. There we go. Once again, I'm going to put matte medium in it. This is still the under layer underneath the, the warm ultramarine blue that we'll eventually paint there.
Okay, let's just check that out. Mm, this could have been a little bit lighter. Maybe I could have put a bit of white in there, made it not quite so dark. I think it's going to be okay. Let's work on the figure now. So I'll just clean this up. There's, you know, that matte medium that I've been using, you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's basically like a glue, right? So you just want to be careful about having that on your paint brushes. You don't want that drying on your brushes and that would ruin your brush basically. So at the end of every episode, I, I, I take all these brushes and I clean them under some lukewarm water with some, uh, you can use like dish soap or anything uh, just to help with that. So, now that we've got a little bit of the background accomplished, let's work on the figure, the dancer in the center. So, do is it looks like obviously there's some white put some white and a little bit of my warm yellow that's a bit too much It can be helpful to have the outline around.
Deborah had to sign off. Temperus is watching. Says hi, everyone. Hey, Temperus. So the the point here is not to necessarily get the exact right color. Uh, this is there's a bit more yellow in there than I want. But I just wanted to sort of get that started because next I'm going to start doing the background again. I'm going to put some uh, warm ultramarine blue over it next. So I'm going to blow dry this real quick. Let's get, out of curiosity, let's just say we just take this ultramarine blue and just start painting with it. Well, you know, uh, hmm. I might put just a little bit of white. I put barely any white in. I didn't put a lot. And I'm painting this pretty dry. I kind of want that a bit of a dry brush quality. Also trying to kind of avoid covering the entire surface up.
I'm leaving part of her hair exposed there, or just not painted in, because uh, that's what she did as well. Okay, I'll blow dry that. I mean, some of these flowers have got a bit deformed as I've painted on them, which is not surprising because, you know, if I had left, left them to dry overnight, I would have retained more of their shape, but I didn't. Now, let's just move this to the side for a second. I want to look at... You know, the these materials. You know, I've got some stuff like this that I could use for a dress. Obviously, it's totally different. And I've also got. Some of this material, this is like from uh, like a screen window. So it does give a little bit more of that mesh. That is kind of nice though. This would be more accurate. I could use the screen to give it that mesh quality. Or I could use this to give it just be a different color dress. It'd be a white dress rather than 
black dress. happen if I if I tried to dye this black would the sparkle still show up like if I put black paint on it would I ruin it let's uh, do another test here I take my black paint or the sort of dark blue that I made for the background. That I just didn't put any gel me or um, matte medium, so it went on pretty thick. It got dark, but maybe too dark. Let's see if I cut up some of the screen material.
Okay, I think I'll use this. Try to distress this a little bit. Hmm. Doesn't distress very well. Um, believe Jesus is Lord says poke into the existing holes at the top with the tip of the pen or pencil to distress. Um, well, I mean, this is like a plastic. Uh, I guess you're right. We can get a bit of. It's interesting that I'm not. I wonder if she did this deliberately, or is this just like a piece of scrap? I mean, she's she's designing costumes for her her opera, um, so she's probably going and shopping and getting the fabrics that she probably intends to use.
Okay, I think that's gonna work. Now I just need to get some string. I think. It's kind of interesting with distressing it in this way, and maybe this was her intent, is it just gives it that slight, like it, it's not just laying flat on her body, a pattern, but it's, there's a little bit of, you know, these, this grid would, would change, would warp, it would move a little bit with the body, right? What is kind of nice about this tube, distressing it, is it stops looking just look like I just took some random piece of material, which I've done, and just slapped it on here. It will look like, you know, I've, I've either I've done something to it or it was just some really nasty thing that I found. So, it's nice to have a little tickle trunk of material. So, I can use that string. Okay, this gives me confidence. Um, I'm gonna prep my materials here just while I'm thinking about it. So what I'll probably do is get this, um, I'll make a solution of matte medium and then dip these into the medium so that they get kind of sticky. And then I'll apply them onto the piece and then they should stick to the surface.
Okay, so... This is wild. <laughs> So I think what I want to do next is work a little bit more on the figure, probably paint her pretty close because, yeah, let's so, let's get her, her skin tone is like, is almost pure white here, right? It's, um, but I'm going to, one of the reasons I put this kind of previous white with a little bit of yellow in there is so that I can use this with some matte medium and then just slowly kind of, oops, maybe it's a bit much. I can get it to the state I want. A little bit more transparency. It's close. Looks pretty good on camera. Let's blow dry it though. Just another coat of that. What's interesting is, you know, that looks very white on camera, at least uh, my preview camera here. Um, but it still actually has, because of the warm yellow coming through from the Impre Matura and the initial layer, it, it doesn't look white. Like there's an energy through here that's just, 
you wouldn't like if I could have just left that just blank bare canvas, right? And it just wouldn't look like this. There's a there's a there's a quality coming through here that I really like. That inner uh, um, warmth, energy radiating, excuse me, radiating out from inside. So let's. Let's take some blue and white. This is my ultramarine blue, my warm blue, and some of the white I was just painting with. I've just mixed that together. Take some of my white here, a bit of this black.
She's going to blow dry that real quick. So my brush is a little bit dirty, which I actually don't mind, uh, because it's just going to allow me to kind of get a little bit more nuance in here. And you notice I painted a bit over top of that necklace, and Now, is it just me, or does that actually look like wire? Maybe it's, it's almost like she's stitched in there. I no, I do have wire. That might be a bridge too far for me to sit, start getting the wire out. I'm going to blow dry that. I think I'm just going to paint this here.
Okay. So it's not not perfect, but there's also because this is not the finished stage here yet, so. Not super, super happy with how the faces turned out. taking a paintbrush right out of the water and applying paint and then get this big goop of wet paint. So let's just gonna paint that out lightly. So let's go to the the dress now. So we'll put
That's one side. Oh, actually, because I'm going to keep that in the middle there, right? So I, I want to get all this prepped up because once I start getting my fingers all gluey, this is going to be a nightmare. So any prep I can do, because I basically don't want to be having to use scissors at all. I'm even gonna make a few. Make some much smaller ones until, in case I go like, oh, these are too big. What was I thinking? And I want everything kind of spread out so that I can pick them. I almost it's like, do I want to use tweezers? I could. Don't blow when that's... Okay. So, where, what kind of container should I use for this? Um, let me just I'm gonna mute this while I get a container.
Okay, I think I'm hooked back up. Yeah, okay. So... Let's see. Uh, is there going to be... Do I have enough matte medium? I think so. Let's just do this. Okay, so maybe before I do that, let's just create a new... Okay, so now I'm ready to start applying the mixed media elements here, my string and the um, screen door piece that I've distressed for her dress. So I'm gonna use some matte medium and I'm gonna dip this in there. So let's put some matte medium into this look. There. So I'm going to start here with the dress. Maybe I'll let's zoom in. Once I'm zoomed in, I'll be zoomed in until I wash my hands. So. So matte medium will dry clear. So while this is going to be kind of, it's going to obscure some things at the present moment. just keep on going right along here. It takes string.
Okay, let's go to the other side. was longer than I wanted, so I'm going to cut that off. Now this is kind of messy, obviously, but um, uh, well, again, remember all that's going to dry totally clear. I'm glad I cut up these smaller pieces because they're definitely coming in handy here. You know, like with anything like this, the more prep you do, the more relaxed you can do the artwork because you're not scrambling and swearing. Like, ah, oh no, what did I do? Ah, I forgot to do. So. Easier said than done. You got to kind of to, to try to anticipate everything you're about to do, but. And also, like, if some of this isn't quite totally stuck down, then, you know, when it dries, you can put a little bit, brush some matte medium on, or also spray it with a fixative. And that will also help.
So, I wonder about using the blow dryer if this is just going to blow them all away. So, let me use the blow dryer and you will see if this is a good idea or bad. Okay, I'm surprised at how, you know, solid that was. I was expecting things to blow off. I tried to keep the air going straight down so that I'm not blowing it aside, which could cause things to fly off. I mean, this could still fly off if I'm pointing straight down, but that's pretty good. I mean, I did, I, you saw how I did that, so I, I kind of really let the, the paint, uh, or the, well, I guess it is paint, the, the matte medium... I allowed that to really soak into that fabric. So I have a if if it was able to withstand the blow dryer, I have a reasonable expectation that that the rest is going to stay on there quite well. Now let's just look at the original. Now we've got this is all uh, matte medium, which will probably dry even more clear as it dries. But what I want to do now is I want to kind of go back into this and paint with just some pure ultramarine blue, my warm blue, around the, the dress, as she herself did. You can see that's like really electric. Now it goes on really electric. It As it dries, it'll darken and won't be quite quite as intense. Oops. But one nice thing about ultramarine blue is that as it dries it uh, it just has that this famously just deep, deep color, and which is super satisfying. It looks gorgeous.
As always, it's very hard to resist the urge to paint everything in. You know, to leave little bits of unexposed canvas or... As I said, that's going to dry and, and go much darker. Um, and if I want it to be a little bit brighter, I could add a little bit more white back into there. But let's just see how that works or how that uh, handles that color. Um,
Again, that's going to change a little bit as it dries, so... So let's blow dry this and just see how that blue starts to calm down. Uh, Jillian says, Michael, is it okay to just crochet uh, the tool and use it for the dress and then stick sequins, sequins on instead of fabricating flowers? Of course! Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do whatever you, uh, you feel would look nice. Like, these could be candy hearts rather than, than flowers. They could be... Uh, little emoji happy faces. I mean, you could really go go wild with this one. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Let's uh, let's go back in on the face here. this again. Let's take some warm red. Maybe a little bit of warm blue just to darken it down a bit. A little bit of white to, to kind of mute it. Uh, maybe that was too much. Well, actually it might be fine. It looks too dark, but it might actually be okay. Maybe while I've just got this red on my paintbrush, let's just go down to the feet.
adding a bit of white into this red and then I'll paint that red back again. This little this piece is laying on the canvas. Where did that come from? Okay, well, let's just can't doesn't I don't see where it would have blown off of, but that's one of those things I'll I'll notice ten minutes after the episode airs. Ah, that's where it is. Ah, that's what it was. Ugh. Cool, that distress quality. <laughs> this is weird. I mean, my, my version is weird. Hers, I think, is awesome. Uh, taking my brush out of the water and not drying it off and it just there's water that drips off the brush onto the painting I'm thinking about maybe getting the syringe out and putting some blue paint in for for her that little crown of um, flowers on the top of her head there.
Okay. Let's, uh... Let's take... I'm gonna get my mat... The gel medium back out again. Okay, so I put some gel medium here and my ultramarine blue paint. So rather than just putting it directly on, just to save some time, let's mix it in together. sink as I clean this earlier. Okay. So we're just about at the end here. A couple of last little things. I want to put a little bit of uh, gel medium into her hair for the flowers around her hair. Maybe I can also use this to touch up anything not so happy with elsewhere. So... Let's... Uh...
How many times does that have to happen? Okay, let me just look at these flowers. I think I'm just going to try to fix a few. Might as well use up all the rest of this blue paint. Ask Lane says it's 3.47 in the morning in the UK. Oh my goodness. You are up late. Well, I'm glad to have you joining me. Okay, I'm going to do a little kind of orange uh, peachy color for the ins middle of these flowers.
to take, um... Put a bit more um, warm blue on here, but again, I'm going to put just a little bit of white. I think just lightening it up. I mean, again, this is going to dry a bit darker again. Uh -oh. Hopefully that starts back up again. stopped there for a minute.
mixing my black really quickly just for some final touches. There is a little bit of temptation on my part to add a little bit of yellow onto here, almost like little dots. I don't know if I want to do that though. Like, let's just. Maybe let's take a bit of this darker color. Maybe that's better, not quite, a little bit more gray. I think it'll look super saturated once we paint with it, so.
So it's that time to do a little side-by-side -side comparison, can see how we did, and um, maybe quickly before we do that, just a quick reminder to like this episode if you liked it. If not, then don't do anything. Uh, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you know when upcoming episodes are taking place. If you want to take a photograph of what you created today, upload it to the Facebook group so that we can celebrate your work once a month. I do a free feedback episode. I think you probably want to participate in that, even if you're not painting this great painting by Florine. Uh, consider whatever else you're working on. I would love to see it. The community would love to see it. You can get some really great, encouraging feedback from all of those people, just like yourself, who are trying to learn and get better. If you want to support the channel with a small donation, you can leave a, as little as a dollar, 25 cents through PayPal, a super chat. Contact me through my email or the Facebook group to send an e-transfer or a good old-fashioned check in the mail. As many of you have done, I appreciate that. So, how did we do here? Pretty close. Considering... You know, the materials are all pretty that I've assembled here are, are uh, uh, not the the classiest thing. We just got string and um, screen from a insect screen. Let's uh, dive in here. Maybe, maybe let's start up by the flowers. Um, you know, if I, you know, if I had let them dry after initially squeezing them out of the syringe, they would probably have kept their shape a little bit more. You know, trying to do this live and it's trying to speed things up by blow drying them and then painting over top of them. Many of them lost their shape and they kind of just turn into a bit of a blob form, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, but, you know, it, it's also not the most important thing that, um, you know, and it's a learning experience as well, right? Um, the background here is a little bit different. Uh, I probably, if I wanted to get closer, I probably could have added a little bit of white into the, and made this a bit more of a gray. And um, so it's interesting that this, what looks like black, is actually a previous layer of the warm blue going over top of this black. So you can see like warm blue is, in this case, ultramarine blue, is really, really dark once it dries. It can also be very transparent, but when you layer it like this, it gets really dark. So I don't mind that that happened, that it got really, really dark there, but it does look different than the original, right? Um, let's look at her dress down here. I think a little bit of that yellow that I painted over top kind of helps. Uh, it it kind of helps make it just appear a little bit brighter. Um, oh, I didn't even notice there was one. On, well, I guess there's in my original drawing there would have been one on her ankle, but I mean, there could have been a bunch of little flowers, just like I did around the crown on her, her forehead. I could have done similar things there now that I notice it, but I think it's okay. Let's actually, let's just look at this dress. You know, distressing it like that now makes it look more like a fabric and less like a bug screen, right? Now it looks like it potentially was what it originally was, maybe some sort of, um, you know, ribbon or something, right? 
I did contemplate putting a bit of string across the top of her top here, uh, but I decided to kind of leave it. I felt like maybe that would be really heavy there, and it's maybe I think we want this dress to feel kind of light, uh, so I, that's why I left that there. It's interesting that you know she didn't. I, I deliberately didn't go right up to the over the shoulders with the string, and neither did she. Um, I think hers works maybe a little bit better than mine in that way, but I don't mind. Um, it does make me wonder, do I want it? Well, I don't know, should I just leave it? Part of me wants to just go in with some ah oh, what it is about this brush that I was always leaking paint or water I mean I want to get, it's almost like she's got little, uh, her eyes, a little bit of blue inside there, or should I just leave it? I think I should just leave it, right? Okay, that's one last look. Now that is a strange one. I was looking forward to this one for that very reason. Um, and I'm a huge fan of her work, obviously. So it's kind of fun to play with some different materials and get my fingers a little bit more dirty than I normally do. Um, very cool. <laughs> okay, everybody, enjoy the rest of your evening or your morning. Pascaline, go to bed. Um, Jillian says, well, I think this might become an Easter project. I believe Jesus says, amazing string and bug screen. Sir, you're a genius. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. It's very sweet of you to say. Okay, everyone, have yourself a great night. I can't wait to see you again. Join the Facebook page to find out about all the new episodes. We'll see you again very soon. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Goodbye.